When researching Scientology this week, I came across an article explaining the difference between a religion and a cult. It said, quote, a religion is an old cult. A cult is a new religious movement. And I think there's some truth in that. When the world's religions first came about, uh, many people at the time, I'm sure, saw them as cults. Uh, But that definition doesn't begin to address how sinister I believe the cult of Scientology to be. Uh, Dictionary.com defines cult a little better, in my opinion, calling it, quote, a religion or sect considered to be false, unorthodox, or extremist, with members often living outside of conventional society under the direction of a charismatic leader. Google defines it a little better still. Quote, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. Strange and sinister. I think those adjectives are very apt when used to describe Scientology. To me, Scientology is like the neighborhood pedophile. Not that every neighborhood has one, I hope. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's going to give you uh, some ice cream. I'll let you watch some cool movies, talk about how great you are become your bestest, bestest friend in the whole world, tell you how special you are and no one else really understands it. And then one night, it's going to stick its creepy finger in your brain hole and pretty soon it's telling you about all the bad things that are going to happen to you and your family if you try to make it go away. Yep, just like a pedophile will molest your body, a cult uh, or Scientology is going to molest your mind. Harsh comparison? Yeah, definitely. Well-deserved? I I think so. Uh, The more I research this episode, the the more I felt sure that was actually a very fair comparison. This shit to me uh, is way darker than the average religion. And you know how I feel about religion in general. Find out why I drop the fucking time suck hammer on L. Ron's twisted dream in this scathing, not brainwashed, not clear episode of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Welcome to the show, Time Suckers. I hope you enjoy this bonus suckage as much as I enjoyed research. Holy shit, man. Big thanks to Time Sucker Casey Sadowski for recommending this topic via Twitter a long time ago. Thanks to British Time Sucker Rebecca Pridmore for offering uh, her help on this one. Uh, she was uh, she met her husband, if I remember correctly, uh, at an at a anti-Scientology protest. Uh, I was going to hit you up, Rebecca, but I, I ran out of time. I just uh, I went overboard. Into a true time suck of watching multiple documentaries, YouTube interview clips, web articles, big fat book on this one. Uh, We're going to suck Elrond so hard today. We're going to suck Tom Cruise a little bit. He's going to suck Scientology so good, I'm probably going to get some scary emails. Uh, And and big thanks to you listening right now. Over 30 total episodes uh, in the time suck can, and things are going stronger than ever. Thanks entirely to you. Uh, You guys stop listening, this stops happening. It's pretty simple, and I'm so thankful that it's uh, growing that it's moving in the right direction. Uh, Thanks to all of you who purchased the first generation of the Time Suck t-shirt. Sorry if you tried and were unable to get one. We we did sell out of a few sizes, uh, but now uh, we're restocked. And now it goes all the way up to 5XL to accommodate more love and time suckers who have a little more love to give. And again, uh, the shirts, like it says on timesuckpodcast.com, they run a little small, so if you normally wear like a men's large, you know, get an XL and so on. And I will post the pics some of you have sent in wearing those uh, to my Instagram, uh, at Dan Kelman's Comedy. Sorry, I haven't gotten back to uh, any social media posts or emails the past week. Uh, I have been buried uh, between regular life responsibilities, touring, and then two episodes to research. Um, and again, <laughs> I probably went a little overboard on this one just because uh, I-, I wish I would have just had a month just to stop my life and just learn everything I could possibly learn about it. It's so fascinating. Uh, thanks to all of you who uh, have been doing your Amazon shopping uh, by clicking on the Amazon link at timesuckpodcast.com, taking you back there and shopping like you normally would. Uh, thanks to those of you who donated this past week via PayPal, so generous, uh, using the button on timesuckpodcast.com. And thanks to those uh, who subscribed. Uh, to the show, so you get each episode the second they come out. And so many uh, wonderful reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm blown away continually by that. Already around uh, 420, uh, I think, on iTunes. So so moving steadily towards that 500 review. Pablo motherfucking Escobar uh, bonus episode. Uh, some more bonus suck. Okay, and now before we get into it, time for me to eat some crow. Time for me to, to wipe a little pie uh, off my face with some Time Sucker updates. Updates! Get your time sucker updates. All right. Uh, those of you who heard last week's episode on Blackbeard uh, know that I went off, uh, you know, fairly hard on Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, really made fun of how dumb I thought he was for thinking how the earth was flat after he said that he believed that on his podcast. 
Well, uh, <laughs> the next week he admitted he was kidding. He was trolling us. God damn it. You got me, you big son of a bitch. So the uh, the NBA Flat Earth All-Star team is, is back down to only one member, Kyrie Irving, as far as I know. Uh, time suckers will. Uh, Mick Garrett, Terry Patterson, uh, others pointed that out to me. Thank you for that. Um, also, uh, time sucker. God, I just got an, another one from um, from from Jordan. Uh, Jordan Kasusik uh, also pointed that out to me. So, yep. Sorry, sorry, Shaq. Uh, please uh, do not hurt me. I, I I went a little hard there. Uh, another and just one more update. Not going to spend much time on the updates uh, this week because I, I, I know you sent a lot in, but there's just too much t- Scientology to dig into. Uh, I'm chomping at the fucking bit to get into it. A time sucker named Kevin in Boise, Brad out in Pittsburgh, and others let me know that there has been a recent Sasquatch sighting very very near to me uh, in my beautiful home state of Idaho. On March 22nd, an unidentified 50 year old woman from the town of Tensed. Idaho, little north Idaho town, uh, just over 100 people on the Coeur d'Alene Indian Reservation that, that was originally, random trivia, uh, named Temsid, but then the post office uh, misspelled it as Tensed, and I guess the, the residents were just like, nah, fuck it, whatever, we'll, we'll go with Tensed, we, we, we don't care, uh, we're, just, we're just trying to stay off the grid out here in northern Idaho. Uh, well, this, this uh, woman claimed Bigfoot caused her, to, uh, her car to crash. She claims that Bigfoot, around eight feet tall, Uh, was chasing a deer along Highway 95 near Potlatch, Idaho, and then the deer ran in front of her car, and she hit it. And I I love that she chose to remain uh, unnamed for the paper, for the interview. As if the hundred other residents of Tents can't figure out who's claiming Bigfoot wrecked their car. There's probably no more than three 50-ish-year-old women in Tents, and I'm guessing only one of them uh, had their car wrecked last week. So, you know, that's who's talking about Bigfoot. Uh, apparently, the woman was uninjured, uh, kept driving to pick up her husband from work, <laughs> and then and then drove over to the Benoit County Sheriff's Office to report the accident. Man, I bet her husband put her up to it. He's probably pissed that the car was smashed up. Just, what did what, I tell you about keeping your eyes peeled for deer, Nancy? How many times have I told you to slow down? Your reflexes are shit. Your eyes are going. Just slow down. I don't know why he's that Southern. He just moved to Idaho from Georgia. <laughs> she was like, don't you yell at me, Donald Henry. That's what she calls him when she's really mad. Don't, don't you yell at me, Donald Henry. I was watching for deer, but this, but this was different. A, a, a Bigfoot ch- chased a deer onto the road. Are you, are, you, are you off your goddamn meds, woman? What are you talking about? Bigfoot, I saw him. He's the reason the car's messed up. Uh, all right, Marge. Well, you know what? Let's talk to the police then. If, you're, if, you're, if that's your story, let's go file a goddamn police report on Bigfoot. If that's what you're going to fucking tell me happened to your car. You know, and then her head, she was just like, ah, oh, shit, I didn't, I didn't think you'd go this far. But she was sick of Don riding her ass, and now we have a news story. And now we are also done uh, with this week's Time Sucker updates. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. All right, Time Suckers, for this episode, I relied heavily on the wonderful journalistic breakdown of Scientology I read. Uh, a former Amazon.com best nonfiction book of the year, a San Francisco Chronicle top 10 book of the year. Inside Scientology by contributing Rolling Stone editor Janet Reitman. Uh, two weeks ago, I'm walking around with a Jihad Academy book, and now I'm walking around with a book called Inside Scientology that looks like the book a Scientologist would carry around. Uh, God, I have been weirding people out lately, uh, more than usual. People at the local Starbucks I go to <laughs> to do some of my research probably think I'm fucking insane. Uh, so thanks to some of you time suckers for pointing me towards this book. Uh, I saw the Facebook posts. Uh, I also watched a new documentary some of you mentioned uh, in select theaters now called My Scientology Movie uh, with Louis Thoreau, a BBC journalist. I watched Going Clear, the Scientology doc on HBO. And I also watched The Secrets of Scientology, which was a 2010 BBC just one-hour special uh, produced by Panorama. So good. Highly recommend uh, watching that hour-long program. It's just, it's just right there for free uh, on YouTube. And, uh, and I also went to Dianetics.org, The Gateway into Scientology itself, and I watched their intro sales pitch video, which is autoplays if you go to that website. Uh, I've transcribed it for you, and I think uh, breaking it down is a, is a perfect way to start this time suck. Do you know someone who has never really recovered from a serious loss in life or a traumatic experience? And then, and then it shows like a dad slapping some son to the ground. Just, Shut up! You know, just all dickheadish. Or in your day-to-day life, Do you sometimes experience self-doubts, negative thoughts, unreasonable fears, upsets, or irrational behaviors? The painful experiences of our past clearly have an effect on our present behavior. But to what degree 
and why? What causes the mind to depart from rational thought or behavior? That is the subject of Dianetics. Shit, at this point, I have to admit, I'm intrigued. I know they're crazy, uh, but this commercial is still hooking me in a little bit. I'm like, huh, that's fucking, I do uh, think of those things. Every moment of your life, your mind is recording everything that's happening to you. Every sight, every sound, every taste, smell, pain, emotion, touch, everything. Is it? Everything? I feel like my mind recorder might be broken because I forget a lot of shit. Like, I can't usually remember uh, what I had for dinner two nights ago. I, I have to really think hard about what day the trash is supposed to go out each and every week, even though it's always the same day. There is no way in hell I could ever recall some ign insignificant event uh, from 10 years ago. I think people just fucking think they remember shit that never happened. Anyway, uh, back, to the, back to the script. These recordings form what is called the time track a consecutive record of all the experiences you've accumulated throughout your existence. Your mind uses this information to make decisions and solve problems relating to your survival. The better its decisions, the better you survive. Most of this data is stored in your analytical mind, that part of your mind that thinks, remembers, and calculates. But some of your experiences are not recorded into those analytical memory banks. It is a discovery of Dianetics, that all of your painful experiences are stored in a previously unknown part of the mind. It's called the reactive mind. And it throws those experiences back at you in an irrational attempt to get you to avoid that painful thing from happening to you again. How the fuck do you know any of that to be true? Did a neurosurgeon write this book? Did a, did a cognitive behavior specialist? A psychiatrist, perhaps? No, a fucking science fiction author who failed his entrance exam to the Naval Academy, a dude who was placed on academic probation at George Washington University where he studied civil engineering and then dropped out after a couple years. No med school, no formal study of the mind, no psychology, no psychiatry. Fucking nuts on this lunatic to assert his audacious claims. Here's a simple and common example. At some point, you've probably gotten sick from eating tainted food. Later in life, if you see or smell or possibly even think about that particular food again, you start to feel a little nauseous. Now, you know that logically, the mere sight or smell or thought of a food can't physically make your body ill, because you haven't actually eaten it again. Yet, you're experiencing the same sick feeling that you had before. This is your reactive mind, making you re-experience the same perceptions it recorded in that earlier incident, in a crude attempt to protect you from what it believes is a dangerous situation. It reacts solely on stimulus response basis and below your awareness. Uh -huh, does it? If it reacts below our awareness, how is some Pulp Fiction author able to be aware of it in the first place? Get the fuck out of here with this pseudoscience bullshit. The painful experiences hidden in your reactive mind are the cause of your fears, insecurities, negative thoughts, unwanted emotions, and irrational behavior. You've been accumulating these deeply buried experiences throughout your existence. In fact, the most damaging among them occurred before you were born. Wait, 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 what? Our most traumatic memories occurred before we were born. And, and you know that how? Did an alien tell you that in a dream? Did an Illuminati space lizard float down from their thought control base in the moon and whisper that into your lunatic ear? I love religious experts presenting utter nonsense as scientific fact. Dianetics reveals how those negative experiences are stored. Oh, it sure does. <laughs> oh, it does. It gets into some fantastically imaginative and nonsensical sci-fi uh, for that goobly gook. And contains a technology to free yourself from them. Oh, oh you mean the e-reader? A dollar store lie detector test used to get people to confess shameful secrets to possibly blackmail with them, uh, them with later? What would life be like if all the pain you've experienced no longer affected your abilities, emotions, and behavior? <laughs> now that is a sales pitch, man. I will say religions and cults have the best fucking sales pitches. Want to live forever? Want to have a bunch of women up in heaven? Just sign up, give us a chunk of your income for the rest of your life, and it's a done deal. Want to no longer experience pain? Want to totally control your own destiny? Want to never get sick? 
Want to have superhuman strength? Want to have lasers? Shoot out of your dick. Want to fly around in a golden dragon? Just drink the Kool-Aid. You would think and behave rationally. Make the best possible decisions relating to your survival. You would be able to utilize your imagination and creativity to the fullest. You would be confident, more intelligent, more productive, and happier. Again, with the fantastic, totally unrealistic sales pitch that preys on everyone's desire for some magic shortcut that's going to get them ahead in life. You, you, you want a bigger dick? Want to bench press 500 pounds tomorrow? Want to literally shit $100 bills every time you defecate? Just drink the Kool-Aid. Just, just take the join now pill. Throw it down. It's all possible if you just believe. You would be yourself, free to enjoy life and reach your fullest potential. In short, your mind would be clear. That is the goal of Dianetics. People achieve this state every day, and so can you. You know, no wonder they hate psychiatry uh, vehemently. It's, it's their direct competition, right? Uh, but unlike them, it relies on actual, uh, you know, scientific knowledge uh, gained through careful experimentation taught at medical school while they get to just coast on some, uh, some fiction. Why does anyone buy this? Why would people join and stay in an abusive, manipulative cult? Uh, why, why do some people stay in an abusive uh, or stay with an abusive, manipulative partner? They're not strong enough to stand up for themselves. They don't feel like they're worthy of something better. They don't truly understand how they deserve to be treated. Uh, the human ability to rationalize irrational nonsense is powerful. Now, Scientologists assert that Scientology means the study of truth. Uh, I think the study of uh, half-truths and bullshit is a more apt description. Scientology, uh, they get really defensive about criticism. They feel like they're the victims of a smear campaign. And are they? Fuck yes. Fuck yes. It's just not an innocent smear campaign. Calling yourself a religion shouldn't protect you from criticism and investigation. If anything, it opens you up to it. And when you are as controlling and corrupt as Scientology blatantly appears to be, you're going to see this in this episode, uh, especially if you're unaware of, of Scientology, uh, you should be vehemently criticized. It's what you fucking deserve, right? If I suddenly made up some crazy sci-fi shit, came up with the Church of Nimrod, where, where Nimrod is the creator of the universe, who also happens to be a giant space Sasquatch the size of a galaxy with the head of a chubacabra who rides a black unicorn with flaming suns for eyes. And Nimrod demands that I stomp the skull of a cocker spaniel flat once a month to prove my obedience to him. So I am worthy of living forever in his Nirvana ball sack, which is where heaven is. One of his balls is the Alpha, the other ball is the Omega. And all of a sudden you show up at my door, find a bunch of dead puppies with smashed in heads and call the police. I don't get to legitimately claim to be the victim of some kind of religious persecution when the police show up. No, I'm a fucking maniac who should be arrested, you know, who should be stopped for being a maniac. Uh, and they're, they're very, they're very uh, sensitive to uh, being called a cult, you know. You know, if it's not a cult, they should be able to handle some criticism. If it's not a cult, I think uh, current leader David Miscavige uh, would, would make public appearances, give interviews. If it's not a cult, uh, they wouldn't cut people out who leave the you know, church uh, and, you know, away from their families, never talk to them anymore. Uh, they wouldn't charge you for information. You wouldn't have to pay to level up. And by the way, if you just heard a squeak, uh, I felt guilty about uh, uh, not paying any attention to my dog, <laughs> like Benny, the last couple of days, my puppy. Uh, and so I've allowed her, I've taken off her little dingle-dangle collar that makes a lot of noise, and I've, I'm testing her, um, seeing how cool she can be with hanging around the podcast for a little bit. And, of course, out of her roughly 100 toys, she finds the fucking squeakiest one to, 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 to chew on in the background like a dickhead. She's doing it on purpose. She's, she's, a, subver she's a subversive uh, person. What is it called? Suppressive. That's the negative people in Scientology. She's a suppressive puppy right now. But anyway, if you hear that, I apologize. That's what it is. Hopefully it's not a big deal. Hopefully you're not like, fuck this podcast. I can't handle occasional puppy squeaks. How did Scientology get here, though? You know, what really does it mean to believe in Scientology? Well, to find all this out, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, this totally is a, a history podcast, by the way. I, I finally uh, completely accepted that. And, uh, and now, let's get into some history. It's time for a Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck Timeline. All right, 1911. This is all about L. Ron Hubbard. 1911, L. Ron Hubbard is born as Ron Hubbard. He added the L later uh, in Tilton, Nebraska, on March 13th, 1911. His father, Harry Ross Hub Hubbard, old Hub, uh, served in the Navy. Old Hub was a Navy Navy badass. He was promoted to lieutenant in 1921. The family moved to uh, they moved a ton. They they relocated almost annually to posts uh, while L. Ron or well Ron. I'm going to call him fucking L. Ron. That's what he goes by later. To post in Guam, San Diego, Seattle, Washington, D.C., etc. 
And uh, Elrond grew up to listen to his father and his dad's friends uh, telling tales of naval adventure, man. Naval adventure. This is important. that he's, He heard about that a lot uh, as a kid because it, it gets replayed, as things often do, uh, in his adult life later. He wrote down uh, crazy tales of uh, childhood and military adventure in his journal uh, growing up that, that never fucking happened. Uh, tales backed up by nothing. Uh, not only backed up by nothing, but sometimes completely uh, refuted by actual documented things that happened. Uh, they don't line up with military records of where he was, you know, at that point in his life. Uh, he, he, he tended to project himself into tales of heroism. You know, his, pre- his protagonist, he, you know, he started writing early, were often red-headed heroes. Ordinary men thrust into extraordinary action. Sailors, spies, soldiers of fortune. Had a wild imagination even as a kid. Um, well, Elrond, 1929... Uh, 1929, he joined, tries to join the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and is rejected. He flunks out on the math portion of the entrance exam, can't pass the physical due to nearsightedness. 1930, he enrolls in George Washington University to study civil engineering. Doesn't do well. Gets put on academic probation. Poor grades. Doesn't apply himself. 1931, the summer after his freshman year, he earns a commercial glider license. Fascinated with the concept of motorless flight and enrolls, uh, gives himself a new nickname, Elron Flash Hubbard. Seriously, he goes by for a brief time, it's Flash Hubbard as well. I love that he got a commercial glider license, which, by the way, I did a little research. It turns out that was easier to get than like a motorized plane <laughs> license. I feel like I feel like a commercial glider license compared to like a regular aviation license at that time is like um, uh, rollerblades compared to a skateboard. You know, it's like, okay, you're good at rollerblades, but it fucking still still sucks uh, in a bad way compared to, to skateboarding. Not as cool. Not as cool. And I say that as a former rollerblader. It's always one of the sources of shame in my life. Uh, <laughs> I was actually, in the Flash thing, I, was, I actually roomed, just random trivia, uh, with a dude named Flash Gordon. His real name was Flash Gordon, and he was every bit as fucking weird as you would think someone would be whose name was Flash Gordon. And I mean, and I checked, because when he, he was like 19, uh, I, was, I was going to Gonzaga, <laughs> and this dude shows up. It was one of those weird situations where like we lost one of our friends that moved out, and then the landlord was like, well, you got to get somebody else, and just without even fucking running it by us, just like started sending, you know, kids over or advertising it. And we get this dude showing up, says like, hey, I'm Flash Gordon. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. Like, I refuse to believe him. Shows me his driver's license. It's not like a nickname. His legal first name was Flash, and his last name was Gordon. Uh, and apparently he grew up on some weird compound. Of, cu- of course you do when you're fucking Flash Gordon. Anyway, 1932. Uh, Elrond drops out of college, also meets his future wife, his uh, first future wife, uh, Polly, a uh, flying enthusiast at, at a Maryland airfield. Tries his hand at freelance journalism, but soon gives that up for a career in pulp fiction. Quickly written, mass-marketed, action-packed stories, popular of the time, uh, many of which were ongoing Kind of uh, an early uh, entertainment precursor to television. 1933, Elrond, he, he finds some success with Pulp Fiction. He's able to uh, crank out enough stories to, to pay his bills. He, they pay him a penny per word. Uh, he's able to write within a variety of genres, uh, you know, which I think kind of like plays into his ability to create religion later. He can do westerns, detective stories, war stories, tales of exotic adventure, even romance. Like he is constantly cranking out stories. He's training his brain constantly to make up shit. That's like... The number one thing in his life. Uh, really good at pumping out a lot of entertaining fiction at a fast pace. Um, yeah, and that's going to, that's gonna, again, that's going to help him get his greatest work of fiction, Scientology, going later. 1934, uh, he joined the Fiction Guild in New York City. A group of about 300 fiction authors living in New York City uh, gains a reputation among them for being a fantastic storyteller. Also gains a reputation for being full of shit. Another writer and peer, Frank Goober, Gruber, <laughs> Goober, <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh so hard. Mr. Goober. Mr. Goober. Uh, Goober, party of one. Uh, he wrote in his uh, memoir uh, that one day a young 20-something Elrond was holding court with other writers. So he's, you know, he's at this fucking meeting with the other writers, and he's regaling them with tales of adventure. He's probably wearing a fucking sailor's hat like he wore later in life, like a douchebag. He's talking about his fucking tales. And, uh, <laughs> and Frank said, I love this. He began writing them down. But, you know, because because like there was just so many outlandish tales, and he knew he always told stories where he did this for six years. He, he was a, he was in the U.S. Marines for seven years. He was an Amazon explorer for four years. Uh, he was a big game hunter in Africa for three years, and just on and on and on. And he said by the end of that particular get together, uh, he asked Ron if he was eighty three years old. And Ron was like, "What? Eighty three? And he's like, "Well, that's how old you'd have to be to have done everything you just claimed." I fucking love that he called him on it. And and I guess uh, uh, Elron was super butthurt about that. 
uh, very sensitive is another one of his qualities to criticism. Did not appreciate being called out. But yeah, he's a pathological liar. And I've met people who do that. Uh, if you're familiar with my stand-up, you know, I did that big, uh, bit about Rick slapping salmon, punching bears. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I, I worked with a lady years ago at this counseling center called, uh, her name was Season. Why did I just say that? You know, I didn't say her last name and I didn't say where I worked. So fuck it. I'm not going to cut that out. I don't, I don't ever cut anything out of these, by the way. I, I, I do virtually no editing, which I, which I like. It seems more honest. But uh, anyway, this lady, who may or may not be, have been named Season, she probably made that up too, uh, she would do that. I remember joking with the other counselors. Uh, I was at this group home. She was the cook. And she just fucking made up so many things. Just made up so many, like, uh, obviously, because like, she was a truck driver for 10 years. And then, you know, she was a teacher for 15 years. And, but it was like a lot of careers that couldn't happen simultaneously. Like supposedly this full time, this full time. Like whatever you brought up or if you brought up somebody did something, she did that for several years. <laughs> anyway, 1935, 1936, Elrond tries his hand at screenwriting in Hollywood, moving there in 1935, uh, and he does, he does uh, write the Saturday morning serial adaptation, The Secret of Treasure Island, but that's all he gets, and you know, he, and he can't pay his Los Angeles bills with just you know, the one thing in two years, and then so he moves to go live near his parents just outside of Seattle in 1936, he tries writing a novel, also begins to study marketing. Apparently, he tells his wife, Polly, Quote, I have high hopes of smashing my name into history so violently that it will take legendary form. That goal is the real goal as far as I'm concerned. Whoa, well, you know, mission accomplished, buddy. You certainly did that. 1939, Elron is sick of cranking out dime store western and adventure stories. He begins to focus on a newly popular fictional genre, sci-fi, and he's fucking good at it. The new young editor of the now popular Astounding Science Fiction magazine, John Campbell, loves him, nurtures his talents, and soon his stories fill the magazine's pages. 1941, uh, World War II, it's breaking out. Elrond uh, again tries to join the Navy. This time he's accepted, you know. On July 19th, 1941, he's commissioned as a junior grade lieutenant in the Naval Reserve. You know, I guess with the advent of World War II, they're just a little less concerned with the nearsightedness, you know? They're, they're going to take a wider swath of, of recruits. Later, uh, Scientologists would paint Elrond as a master mariner and a fearless war hero, an image Elrond carefully cultivated himself, uh, when in fact, never saw a single battle, not one, uh, was relieved of helming a submarine chaser that he got to, like, fucking, uh, you know, be in charge of for, like, a month when he... Uh, accidentally ended up in Mexican waters, didn't realize he was in Mexican waters, and then just, uh, you know, without uh, getting authorization, just starts to use the Los Coronados Islands uh, for some target practice. After that, uh, he hangs out on a fucking cargo ship. 1945, Elron ends up, like many veterans, in Los Angeles after the war, meets an eccentric dude named Jack Parsons. Uh, Jack was a self-taught chemist, which sounds incredible to me, a literal rocket scientist who is the uh, leader of a new rocket program at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Parsons was also an eccentric who dabbled in the occult. He was a devotee of British black magician Alistair Crawley, a.k.a. The Great Beast, a uh, future Time Suck episode, I'm sure. Parsons came from a wealthy family, had lots of money, was witty and sophisticated, loved throwing decadent parties for his artistic friends that included partner swapping and Romanesque orgies. Crazy shit for the American 1940s. And Parsons had turned his 11-bedroom L.A. estate into this kind of artist compound, calling it the Parsonage. Get the fuck out of here. Jack was a sci-fi fan, and he was very familiar with L. Ron's stories from his astounding science days before the war. So he meets Ron just by chance, lets Ron live there, becomes enamored with L. Ron, and now L. Ron begins wearing a military suit. This is when he first starts doing this after the war, like in regular life. He's got some extra medals pinned on there. He's given himself... And he's the storyteller, just kind of like he was back at the writer's uh, fucking group in New York, you know? He's telling his stories, all these crazy tales of military adventure that never fucking happened, but presented them as facts. Stuff like, as recounted later by another uh, Parsonage guest, quote, narrowly escaping from Jap Japanese-occupied Java by taking off on a raft after suffering bullet wounds and broken bones in his feet. He really is like fucking Rick, man. Just slapping salmon, just punching some bears. Oh my God! Apparently, Elron uh, also. I, I just, I just such, I'm so fascinated by that personality type. Just, to, just to say the craziest shit, and and present just utter nonsense as as complete fact. Who fucking does that? Elron Hubbard does that apparently. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, he also, uh, this is uh, very uh, worth worth mentioning. Um, supposedly, tells a resident uh, named Neeson Himmel, an L.A. reporter who was uh, hanging out at the parsonage in those days, 
uh, a guy who would go on to have a fantastic journalistic uh, career in L.A., covering every major crime in the city for decades, including the uh, Black Dahlia murder- murders. Um, well, uh, he tells uh, Neeson and some others that he wanted to start a religion. He was very interested in starting a religion, which actually doesn't isn't uh, as weird as it sounds for that time and place. In the 1920s and 30s, and then going into the 40s, various new spiritual movements had popped up in L.A., stuff like the Theosophists, uh, the Mighty I Am, the Church of Divine Science, the yoga-inspired Vedanta Society. So, you know, it, it's, it wasn't unprecedented for the area. 1946, Elrond convinces Jack Parsons to invest in a vague new company with him, uh, Allied Enterprises, where he and Jack will just, you know, just kind of come up with stuff, just come up with some cool shit, just some business ideas, just whatever pops into their business brains, and they'll share the profit. You know, it's 50-50, other than Jack is supposed to put up 21000 and Elrond comes up with 1200 So it's kind of like a 50-50 if you just fucking, you know, more like a 90-10, like a 90-10, 50-50 split. Uh, and then Elrond takes Jack's money, uh, his, takes his girlfriend, heads to Miami uh, for the business venture of buying a few luxury boats and then sailing them back to L.A. to sell at a big profit. Because that sounds reasonable. Hey, man, I'm just going to, me and your girlfriend, <laughs> it must have been a smooth talker. Or this Parsons guy was a fucking moron. Or he, Me and your girlfriend are just going to go, look, we're just going to go take the money you just gave me for our business. We're going to go to Miami for a while. We're going to get to know the yacht people. We're going to get a yacht. We're going to float around the yacht to, you know, to fucking seem like, you know, like we know what we're doing. Then we're going to get these yachts. We're going to sail them slowly back, just me and your girlfriend, on a yacht. Just going to sail them back over to Los Angeles. And then we're going to sell them for a lot of money. How, how the fuck do you not be like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. You, you and my girlfriend. I'm not going to come, but you guys are going to go. And you're going to be on a boat. Just, to, just you guys on a boat together. When, when I'm not there, when it's, it's, hard, it's, harder, to, it's hard to track people. And you, and you, but you're going to use my money for, to sail on a boat with my girlfriend. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that, that seems good. That seems like a good business plan. Uh, well, uh, Elrond goes full boats and hose. Of course he does. And he just stays. <laughs> he stays. Uh, and he marries Jack's girl. Sarah Northrup, uh, even though he's still technically married to his first wife, Polly. Uh, you know, that, come on, bro. That's not the Allied Enterprises way. And uh, Jack, doesn't, he doesn't care for it. And he gets a court injunction to prevent Elrond from at least leaving the country on board the boat he's paid for with his fucking girlfriend. And, uh, and Elrond pays him back the money to prevent being sued when litigation is threatened. And, uh, and this is the guy who's going to start a new religion, a pathological liar who steals from his friends. Steals her girlfriends. A bigamist. Awesome. 1949, chronic storyteller Elrond, uh, the Ronald, has decided to tackle yet another genre, self-help. In a letter sent on January 13th, 1949, from Elrond to his literary agent, Forrest Ackerman, uh, the Ronald jokes his new book will be so powerful, readers will be able to, quote, (laughs) this is his quote, rape women without their knowing it and communicate suicide messages to enemies in their sleep. That's a, that's a weird reference. That's a, that's a weird angle for that joke. I mean, I kind of get the, the killing your enemies in their sleep, you know, for some kind of military angle. Why, why the raping? Why do, why do you have to go the rape there? I guess, you know, I guess that's just, you know, that's just Ronald being Ronald. That's just classic Elrond. He's fucking killing it with some rape jokes. Uh, also in 1949, Elrond sends a manuscript for what will become Dianetics, book one of Scientology, to the APA, the American Psychological Association, to get their mental health endorsement. And uh, they were basically like, oh, fucking no. And his old sci-fi editor, uh, John Campbell, though, loves the new book, becomes its uh, biggest initial promoter. Dianetics, by the way, is based on the Greek works dia, meaning mind, and nuts, I guess, is through the, so through the mind, Dianetics. Solid title, actually. Uh, Got to give him some credit there. John Campbell wrote in his editor's letter in the December issue of Astounding Science Fiction Quote, it's an article on the science of the human mind, of human thought. Its power is almost unbelievable. Uh Uh-huh. I'm going to say it's completely unbelievable. Uh, Campbell wrote this uh, after an early Dianetic session with L. Ron, where L. Ron had hypnotized him. Yeah, hypnotized him. L. Ron had studied hypnosis in the 1940s. I didn't know that. He fucking hypnotized this dude, fed fed him a bunch of Dianetic shit into his subconscious mind while he's being hypnotized. Now he's a believer. Of course he is. Look, if a comedy hypnotist... Some shitty comedy hypnotist, can I say that, can get someone at a comedy club to believe they're a chicken dance around. I think Elrond can get someone to believe he's discovered a psychological breakthrough. The power of subliminal suggestion uh, is a real thing. Well, Elrond starts hypnotizing others, feeding them his, his self-help pseudoscience. 
a scientific breakdown of the mind by someone who didn't possess the scientific acumen to make it into the fucking na Naval Academy. Okay, 1950. Dianetics is published for the first time on May 9th, 1950 by Hermitage House under the title of Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. And check out its opening statement. This is how the book fucking kicks off. The creation of Dianetics is a milestone for man comparable to his discovery of fire and superior to his inventions of the wheel and the arch. <laughs> ah, the ball's on this guy. Hey, everybody. Remember how a long time ago we discovered fire? Remember the thing that allowed us to start cooking our food and have light in the darkness and stay warm in the winter and create kilns to produce tools and have an industrial revolution someday? Well, this is the new fire. Okay? Okay? All right? This is the new fire, guys. If I can, yeah, that's, it is. It is. Uh, Dianetics is the new fire. And I love how uh, while Dianetics is equal to fire, uh, it's better than the wheel and the arch. Like, like those two comparisons were brought up by somebody. Like like an like a early person here and is like, oh, the new fire. Awesome, El Ron. That's a great job, dude. Man, it's like Dianetics is even as good as the wheel. And El Ron was like, what the fuck did you just say? What the fuck did you just say to me? I said it was as good as the invention of the wheel. The, wheel, the thing that allowed us to travel faster than by, by horseback. That's what I said. I just said that it's the thing that allowed us to till fields with something more powerful than a hoe. The shape that made modern mechanics possible. And then Elrond was like, it's better than the fucking wheel, Donnie. God damn it, you shit bird. I said it was a new fucking fire. That's what I said. Fire beats wheel, you jerk. And then someone else was like, well, I, I think it's as good as the invention of the arch, Ron. I do. I really do. I think it's as good as arch. I think it's as good as the thing that gave us some architectural masterpieces like the Church of St. Peter uh, Colosseum. And then El Elrond was like, what the fuck is with you assholes? First Donnie with his wheel bullshit. And now you with the fucking arch, Nadine. It's better than the arch. All right? For the last time, you guys, it's the new fire. Now shut the fuck up and let me hypnotize you until you get it. And Dianetics marketed itself as a new, better alternative to traditional therapy and psychiatry. Remember when the APA turned him down? Well, now he's like, fuck you guys. You wouldn't let me join your club? Well, I'm going to burn it down then. And to this day, Scientologists are vehemently opposed to psychology and psychiatry. Uh, Dianetics gave 1950s a better sales pitch than psychology and psychiatry did. They told you the mind was, uh, you know, uh, complex. You know, that's what psych psychology and psychiatry were saying, that the, 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 there was all these neuroses that were deeply rooted. that could be hard to cure. Sometimes, you know, just like someone can be born physically damaged, uh, you know, missing a hand, for example, or be blind. You could also be mentally damaged. You could be born with various psychiatric conditions that couldn't be completely cured, you know, but could be managed with psychotropic drugs, such as, you know, being bi bipolar. Well, Scientology came along and was like, nah, nah, fuck that. The mind is super simple. Just a simple machine, has a main processor, the analytical mind, takes in stimuli, sound, smells, tactile sensations, etc., stores them in various file cabinet-like places, painful and traumatic stimuli, you know, they create a mental scar tissue, an engram, and those engrams can become kind of a glitch in the computer, causing it not to work as well. And to get you better, to get you going 100%, uh, we just need to get rid of those engrams. Painful stored memories, many of which Elrond said uh, you experienced, you know, before even being born. And the only way to get rid of those is to be audited. The Scientology equivalent of a therapy session. Confess all of your traumas in an auditing session, purge them out of your mind, and then just become undamaged. Become the most productive version of yourself. It's easy. Just shit out bad memories, and you keep the good ones. Ta-da! Well, uh, people in general like simple solutions. I think it's why politicians use them. You know, let's take our country back. These colors don't run. You know, who cares if they're uh, childishly simplistic, don't always make sense. They're fun to say. They make people saying them feel like they get it, like they have some important answers that they needed. And unlike expensive therapy, Dianetics was cheap also. In addition, in, uh, in addition to having the answers, you know, all you had to do is buy a special book. You know, you had to buy the new fire. It's only four bucks. You don't have to go to a bunch of therapy for years. Just four bucks a fire. Well, only four bucks at first. Uh, but then Elrond starts teaching others how to do uh, auditing sessions. And then soon, a five-week Dianetics course is offered for 500 bucks. Now, this is at a time when an hour with a psychiatrist costs 10 bucks. But unlike psychiatry, again, Dianetics promised to cure you. Solid sales pitch. Well, as you can imagine, peer reviews of the book were not glowing. Uh, writer Jack Williamson, a prolific 20th century sci-fi author who actually coined the term genetic engineering in one of his books, uh, said of Dianetics, To me, it looked like a lunatic revision of Freudian psychology. Uh, sci-fi author, uh, legend of sci-fi, Isaac Asimov, said, I considered it gibberish. All right, 
That's a solid review. Uh, and check out this review in the New Republic by physician Martin Gumpert. Uh, I must confess I have never been confronted by such a bold and immodest mixture of complete nonsense and perfectly reasonable common sense taken from long acknowledged findings and disguised and distorted by a crazy newly invented terminology. Most revolting is the repeated claim of exactitude and of scientific experimental approach for which every trace of evidence is lacking. The author lives continuously on borrowed concepts, though at the same time he attacks them most ungraciously and ungratefully. <laughs> and he did borrow a lot of his concepts uh, from the book. I, I think this is an interesting uh, bit of research. The first edition of Dianetics thanked Freud and Carl Jung, among other mental health pioneers, for the work that he built upon. Uh, but then in later editions, he just removed uh, that. He just uh, refused to acknowledge kind of his sources. Because now he's not trying to just uh, promote uh, a self-help book. Soon he's promoting himself as a leader of a new religious movement, fucking cult. Uh, also in 1950, L. Ron hits a lecture circuit promoting his mental uh, health cure nationwide, kind of like some snake oil, you know, peddler. Uh, and remember, this is a man with zero formal education in mental health. No college degree in anything. He's a fucking fiction writer now posing as a mental health revolutionary. One of the many, many reasons I can't take Scienti yeah, Scientology seriously. And look, maybe the founders of the major religions such as Christianity and Islam don't have backgrounds uh, any more credible than Elrond, but here's the big difference uh, to me. We can't go back and point to government records that prove like, you know, Jesus or Muhammad were, were full of shit if they were. You know, there, there's no records. There's no records. You just have faith that it's true or you don't. It's just, you know, it's a completely personal decision based on, entirely just on belief. We can absolutely prove L. Ron Hubbard is full of shit. That's a major difference to me. You know, you, you can't watch YouTube videos of Jesus explaining why he's actually the son of God, you know, taking in some questions, doing a little Q&A. We can watch videos, uh, many videos of L. Ron, where you can see him and just think, get the fuck out of here. Or I guess if you're a Scientologist, think, yeah, no, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. Okay, 1951. By the beginning of 1951, uh, Hubbard is making a tremendous amount of money. Uh, for the time, off the sales of his new book, and auditing centers are springing up all over the place, uh, promising people to get clear, free from all those pesky engrams. He's living it up. He's having an affair with a 20-year-old college student who joined the Dianetics Revolution. Of course he is. Uh, <laughs> however, because he had no prior, exper prior experience uh, operating a big business full of multiple employees and locations, he spends more than he makes, and Dianetics uh, almost uh, goes away before he gets started. His new movement goes bankrupt. Also in 1951, Elrond would divorce his wife, uh, Sarah, and abandon his baby daughter, Alexis, forever. Uh, he would then deny being her father uh, years later when she tried to reconnect with him when she was 21, uh, saying, Sorry, babe, I'm a total piece of shit, really focused on deceiving people out of millions and growing my insane cult at the moment and fucking around with my young, my young girlfriend. Okay, he didn't say that, but he did abandon his daughter. And, uh, and then he focused on his second Scientology book, The Science of Survival. And uh, he had to, man. He went bankrupt. He had to get some of that cult money rolling in. So 1952, Elrond contacts the remaining roughly 80, only 80 Dianeticists, uh, tells them he has some new info to share with them. He introduces the E-meter, that famous Scientology device the church has used ever since to audit people. Basically, it's a rudimentary lie detector test used to detect uh, memories with emotional charges. That's, that's how he finds those, those pesky engrams, man. Uh, and now Dianetics is a science, according to him. Uh, 1951 uh, is, is the year the term Scientology emerges, the study of knowledge. And now, check out this shit. L. Ron claims that while Dianetics allowed you to truly know how the human mind operates Scientology with his new e-meter and his new book, it allows you to know the human soul. Man, that's a fucking sequel. You thought the first movie was good. First movie just fixes your brain. Second movie, fucking soul repaired. Ah, uh, man, it's the new fire. He's doubling down. You didn't think fire was big enough? Well, we just went fucking nuclear, motherfuckers, for part, for part two. All right, well, Elrond, he tells everyone that the soul is the thetan, saying theta means life and innate self, a being separate from your physical body. And thetans, according to Elrond, according to the Ronald, uh, had existed for eons, floating through space using physical bodies as shells before discarding them and finding a new form. Uh, these beings, these thetans, man, they created the whole universe themselves, uh, and it gets even crazier. After a while, for some reason, these thetans, they get trapped in their own creation. Throughout the years, uh, through, throughout the whole track, as Hubbard calls it, they'd been implanted with a variety of positive and negative experiences and thoughts, and eventually came to believe their original universe-creating power was lost. Oh, man, what a bummer. 
And the goal of Scientology, Elrond said, was to restore that power. Oh, that's good. That's noble. And, and you do this by auditing people with the E-meter? That, does that make sense? Uh, if you're confused right now, uh, that's perfect. It means you're not and probably will never be a Scientologist. Uh, it doesn't make sense because it's fucking nonsense. It's the fictional ramblings of a delusional maniac. How do people sell this shit to other adults? Wasn't anyone like, uh, Ron, how did you know any of this to be true? Really, Donnie? Wow, you just don't fucking get it, dude. First the wheel comparison, now this shit. 1952, Hubbard also founds the Hubbard Association of Scientologists, a training facility, book publisher, and exclusive seller of e-meters. He's growing the brand, taking full ownership of it. No Scientology middlemen. No one to be like, I don't fucking know about this. I do kind of like that. I do, I do understand that. Also, in 1952, uh, Hubbard marries for the third time, the other two marriages being done now, to a 19-year-old beauty, Mary Sue Whip, who was enamored with L. Ron and his ideas. Uh, Mary also didn't have a reputation among early Scientologists for being a big thinker. She's 19. Hubbard is 41. Uh, he met her the year before when she was barely legal. Huh. What kind of 30-plus-year-old man consistently dates women just barely old enough to be adults? Uh, some with a huge fucking ego who doesn't like being bothered with the types of questions some with more life experience would ask. Questions like, who told you about the Thetans? How do you actually know any of this is true? Uh, what's the phrase, a, uh, a cult leader? Uh, early followers claim Elrond was magnetic, that he was extremely charismatic, also, in 1952, Elrond completely rewrote his own biography, creating the myth, uh, mythical version of himself as if he were a character in one of his earlier works of pulp fiction. Started telling pe people he was, he'd been walking the earth like Cain in Kung Fu, you know, just hanging out with some monks in Asia, volunteering in psychiatric hospitals to learn about the human mind, curing veterans of what we'd now call PTSD. He didn't do any of that. 1953, Elrond is back to franchising uh, during uh, his second go with Scientology. And Scientology centers being open around the country, but this time he takes a different approach to marketing. Doesn't advertise it as a cheaper alternative to therapy. Advertise it as being more expensive because the secrets they teach are that good. Pretty genius, really. People want what they can't have. Also, uh, this time around, he sold the book uh, to whoever wanted it. Uh, well, like, again, yeah, the first time he sold the book to whoever wanted it and let them become auditors, let them open their own independent Dianetic Center, centers he couldn't make money off of. Well, fool me once, motherfuckers. You're not getting, you're not getting it this time around. And he knew the best way to make this uh, second version of the brand was to, to make it more than therapy, make it a religion. In a letter to an early associate, Elrond said he wanted to work, quote, the religion angle. He went on to say it's, quote, a matter of practical business. He fucking admitted it. And people still believe this shit. Uh, I'm sure he made up convenient lies to rationalize admitting it uh, was for all, all for the money. Actually, he didn't have to do that because Scientology teaches you that everyone else who's saying anything other than what his new version is, are, they're just liars. It's all made up. Uh, in the 50s, religion was getting more popular. Uh, just more than half of America was Christian in 1950. 69% of the country was by 1959. Psychiatry, other forms of counseling just weren't as popular. So, you know, it's a business move, man. Turn mental science into a religion. Pure and simple. Make some more money. And uh, you don't get uh, ta tax-exempt status and save hundreds of millions of dollars with a counseling center. Also, if you're religion, your auditors aren't to this, uh, held to the same educational standards as counselors are. Right? Counselors have a, a degree. If you're a priest or whatever, you just get to fucking whatever the church decides. Uh, and since Scientology uh, d didn't pass the scientific sniff test, all the more reason to go uh, the religious route this time. Well, 1954, the first official church of Scientology is open in L.A. Hubbard insists the other Scientology groups that had sprung up around the country became franchises. Uh, they'd also become churches. And 10% of their gross income would be sent to the Hubbard Association of Scientologists International. H-A-S-I, also known as the Mother Church. Also, the place that sold e-meters and books exclusively. Books now known as his catalog of scripture that L. Ron, the Ronald, was cranking out at a fanatical pace. This structure would make L. Ron fantastically wealthy later in life. Uh, he built his very own money machine, man. So crazy uh, to see uh, the business structure of a religion documented. Like, I'd love to see something similar uh, on, like, the Catholic Church, for example. You know, how much fun money has been funneled back to Rome over the years but I don't think the records exist uh, the same way that they do with Scientology. 1956, uh, took a bit to get the cash cow really rolling in. In 1956, the gross income for Scientology was only $103,000. By 1959, it's $250,000, but it's going to go way, way up later. Uh, 1960, by the time that rolls around, L. Ron had replaced most of his initial Scientologists, most of whom had become disillusioned with his teachings, probably because his teachings were ludicrous. Uh, he wrote a lot of weird sci-fi shit in the 1950s that we're going to get into a little bit later. Uh, he found some new, generally young, bright-eyed, and bushy-tailed converts eager to chow down on whatever semi-spiritual bullshit L. Ron was feeding them. Uh, L. Ron also became increasingly paranoid regarding his followers. He was tired of having people leave. 
uh, and then criticizing his brand after they left. He came up with a new, more aggressive form of auditing for new members. Asked them more personal questions. Had they ever stolen? Had they ever killed? Been violent? What were their sexual fetishes? Had they ever been critical towards Elrond? You know, all asked while new members are hooked up to those trusty e-meter lie detector tests. And now the slightest misstep by members, of, uh, as far as criticism goes, is punished. You know, he's using classic behaviorist techniques to mold his followers into totally transparent people. Totally devout. Uh, he pays church employees uh, enough to live on, but not enough to save, making them financially dependent upon him as well, less likely to leave. And how does this tyrant get away with all this? Well... From early accounts, he was super charismatic. He had an extremely powerful personality. He convinced himself that the lies he told were not only the truth, but the truth, the only truth. Mankind needed him to save them. You know, he was tried in true cult recruiting techniques like uh, hot young women. Young testosterone-filled dudes will join almost any cult if they think it'll lead to sex with a hot young woman that they're, that they're into. L.A. in the 1960s, pretty young girls in hot pants and miniskirts hanging out on Sunset Boulevard, smiling like they know some secrets, leading young men right into the hotbed of Scientology. 1964, L. Ron is interviewed by the Saturday Evening Post, which was right up there with Life magazine in terms of cultural importance uh, as far as being wide-read at that time. And according to former members, he was overjoyed that they wanted to see what Scientology was all about. He thought this was going to be a big moment, right? Going to blow them up into the mainstream. And he let them into his St. Hill Manor compound in England to get the inside scoop on what it was all about. And then when the article came out, uh, they tore him a new asshole. Called him the modern equivalent of an old-time snake oil peddler. And he was never the same, apparently, after that. Uh, He was angry. He was angry, Ronald. He wanted to stomp out any detractors and critics from that point forward far more aggressively than he had before. 1966, Elrond gets some boats. Uh, he purchases a small fleet, and for the next roughly 10 years, spends a lot of time sailing the high seas with his closest and some of his highest-ranking Scientology members. Scientology's infamous Sea Org is born. Remember how he's a little kid, hanging around those Navy guys, you know, wanting to be a part of their stories? Well, now he's got his own fucking crew. Remember remember the RS Navy didn't want to have anything to do with him first time around? Second time around, they, they pulled his rank, put him on a fucking cargo ship. Not anymore. Uh-uh, he's got Sea Org now. And now the hippie vibe of 60s Scientology gives way to a new military vibe the church will hold on to, uh, has held on to to this, to this day, because uh, they're at war, man. They're at war with the world. They're at war to save the world. They need to act like soldiers. Long hippie hair is cut short. Beards are shaven. Uniforms are worn. worn. Uh, all superiors are called sir. Doreen Casey, a new high-ranking Scientologist who ran Sea Org on Hubbard's behalf early on, told other members, quote, either you are 100% with me or you are against me, and you will be dealt with accordingly. Yeah, they're not fucking around anymore, man. 1967, a series of awards and punishments are instituted on Sea Org. Members who make mistakes who question Elrond's beliefs are, for example, draped in he- heavy chains to signify a degraded state. People who really messed up are locked up in the bowels of the ship for days or allegedly sometimes even weeks. And apparently, according to some former members around this time, they used a punishment called overboarding for a few years. Uh, like They would fucking toss you overboard. You could be thrown off just yeah, regular overboard, <laughs> depending on what you did, I guess. They could put a blindfold on you, then throw you off. Uh, they could put a blindfold, tie your hands together behind your back, then throw you off. Uh, apparently, if you're really, really bad, if you're super naughty... And you were like, fucking, I don't like what Elrond said there. They're like, oh, man, now we got to tie your feet and your hands and put a blindfold on and throw you off the ship. And I guess there was some ritual that went along with this, and Hubbard would, <laughs> would stay before you got tossed over. We commit your sins and errors to the deep and trust you will rise a better Thetan. What the fuck? <laughs> Hubbard, during this time, is uh, rarely seen, even by Scientologists. He's apparently on some sort of spiritual quest. Hubbard also really uh, upped his crazy this year. He relays to his followers... Uh, through more writing that he's been researching the deepest mysteries of the universe. Said he recently uncovered uh, some at great peril to himself. This is where we get the stuff that we, people talk about with Scientology today. He says he walked through, quote, the wall of fire. Says he learned secrets where the material involved is so just villainous that it is carefully arranged to kill anyone if he discovers the exact truth of it. Actually, he doesn't say villainous. I, I, I thought I'd correct that because I just I, uh, copied and pasted this quote. Vias. That's an interesting word. V-I-I-O-U-S. It's so vias that it is carefully arranged to kill anyone if he discovers the exact truth of it. I am very sure that I was the first one that ever did live through any attempt to attain that material. He's the only one, you guys. 
He's the only adventurer with the courage and the strength and the stamina to uncover the truth. Was he so crazy that he convinced himself he really was doing this shit? Or was he sitting on a typewriter, having a drink, laughing to himself, just like these motherfuckers? Ah, don't believe anything. Ah, they, they will literally believe anything I say. Ah, wow. Man, it is good to be L. Ron. I think, I, I think it's about time I got myself some new 18-year-old girls. Well, apparently, some of the secrets he was finding around this time would be some super weird shit with Xenu, an alien dictator, and some supposed catastrophe 75 million years ago that is still affecting us today. I'm going to describe all that later. 1969, L. Ron declares war against psychiatry in a memo written to his wife. He said he wanted to, quote, take over absolutely the field of mental healing on this planet in all forms. Man, he's really pissed about them not endorsing his first book. Uh, he also tells his followers they have to do more. Uh, in all the universe, Hubbard said, there is no other hope for man than ourselves. <laughs> man, he knows how to write a good narrative, doesn't he? Uh, one of the first things uh, you learn about writing is to have stakes. You know, we talk about that on TV all the time. Are the stakes high enough for the viewer to care? You know, are the, st- are, are the stakes so dramatic? That people are like, are the, is the person going to live or die? You know, is the relationship going to happen or not? What are the stakes? Well, Elrond, he went for the ultimate stakes, the fate of the entire fucking human race. 1973, uh, by then, Elrond had become a little Howard Hughes-esque, spending most of his time alone. He's paranoid about critics, paranoid about someone trying to take Scientology down from the inside. He demands absolute obedience from his followers. If staff rebel in any way, Elrond would have their family harassed with threatening phone calls. Their phones could be tapped. They could be followed by other members. Creepy shit. All part of the Scientology policy of, quote, fair game, initiated by Elrond in 1965, in which Elrond instructed his followers to handle a suppressive person, both within and outside the church. A truly suppressive person or group has no rights of any kind, and actions taken against them are not punishable, is what Elrond wrote. He also wrote that a suppressive person may be deprived of property or injured by any means by any Scientologist without any discipline of the Scientologist, may be tricked, sued, or lied to or destroyed. And basically, a suppressive person is just someone who denounces the Church of Scientology. Like, I'm a a suppressive person. I'm super suppressive. Scientology's website defines it as the suppressive person is also known as the anti-social personality. Within this category, one finds Napoleon, Hitler, the unrepentant killer, and the drug lord. But if such are easily spotted, if only from the bodies they leave in their wake, anti-social personalities also commonly exist in current life and often go undetected. Uh Uh-huh. It's just somebody who doesn't fucking like their teachings. Now, I should note, Elrond technically canceled the policy of fair game in 1968 under intensifying scrutiny of Scientology by various governments, such as Australia, who threatened to ban it altogether, uh, but he did not ban its practice, and it goes on to this day. Also, to get a jump on suppressive organizations such as the IRS, uh, Scientology begins planting members within its ranks. This was a part of what would later be revealed by the FBI to be the largest program of domestic espionage in U.S. history, Operation Snow White. The intent of Operation Snow White was to cleanse Scientology of any negative image by purging any documents critical of the church or its founder. The IRS, FBI, U.S. Justice Department, Better Business Bureau, American Medical Association, etc., 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 all infiltrated by Scientologists whose job it was to steal and dispose of any documents or files negative towards Scientology. Man, that is a fucking ambitious right there he wanted to just truly like what a revisionist he is that's such a consistent trait of his you know he just comes up with some new shit and he wants just to bury any trace just aggressively go after anyone who disputes the new doctrine uh elron had always loved to write in history man now he wanted to do it in a bigger way well the operation broke down when the fbi apprehended some scientologists in dc and then raided scientologist compounds in dc and la using 156 agents its largest raid ever for the time uh looking for those uh, snow white documents Hubbard freaks out, goes into hiding. Uh, even though they hadn't put out a warrant for his capture, uh, man, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. And, and they are being so aggressive uh, also towards uh, members who leave their ranks at this time. And I, you know, that whole the best defense is a good offense. Uh, check out this shit. Scientologist Paulette Cooper left the church, published a critique uh, entitled The Scandal of Scientology in 1971. Church operatives allegedly tap her phone, break into her apartment. Uh, write her number on bathroom stall walls, always wondering who was writing uh, for a good time called blank. Turns out it's a Scientologist. Handed uh, insulting flyers out to her neighbors, alleging she was a prostitute. There's a fucking church doing this. Stole her stationery, sent out bomb threats, got her charged with three felonies, almost sent to prison. And when you watch documentaries on this group and you witness firsthand them harassing the shit 
out of former members they've labeled suppressive persons, uh, it's easy to believe that they did this uh, stuff as well. Well, 1979, Operation Snow White does come to an end after the FBI raid. Several high-ranking Scientologists go to prison, including L. Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue Hubbard. She gets five years in federal prison after pleading to a conspiracy charge, heads off to Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, L. Ron himself, careful not to have his name on any of the documents, and there's, you know, the whole church is fighting to, like, fucking clean up the, the mess and make sure he doesn't get, uh, you know, indicted on anything. There's a fear amongst them that if, you know, anybody does something or doesn't clear up something that's going to get him caught, they're going to be fucking banned. They're going to be a suppressive per person. They're never going to they're never going to get to attain, you know, the possibility of become a, an operating thetan. You don't rat out on your messiah, uh, you know, and he, so he walks away. He doesn't get in trouble. Uh, after the trial, he flees into exile. He does do that with two trusted Scientologists, and he's never seen in public again. So it did force him underground. Uh, literally never seen again by any member of the press, his own children, or in federal, federal investigators who still have some questions for him. And while in exile, he, he would come to run the church through an ambitious former assistant of his, David Miskevich. Now, uh, until David took over as leader for real after L. Ron's death on January 24, 1986. At the age of 74, he died of a stroke on a remote ranch he'd been hiding at near San Luis Obispo, California. Uh, while his group was under investigation again, actually, this time by the IRS, who accused them of diverting over $100 million uh, you know, in U.S. earnings into foreign accounts. Scientology and the IRS do battle in court, by the way, all the way until 1993, when Scientology finally agrees to pay uh, $12.5 million in back taxes, and then the IRS agrees to give them tax-exempt status going forward. <laughs> Scientology allegedly uh, hired private investigators to look into the private lives of high-ranking IRS members to deter them from continuing to investigate them. Fucking how about that? They went to war with the IRS— and they won. They won. That's a scary organization. Uh, by the way, at the time of his death, L. Ron was allegedly worth an estimated $650 million. Right? Not bad for a pulp fiction author uh, who was broke just 35 years earlier. And now that we made it all the way to Hubbard's death, let's bounce out of the, uh, this timeline for the rest of this episode. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. All right, so now we have a basic understanding of L. Ron Hubbard, kind of how he grew his cult. But what are they up to right now? How has David Miscavige uh, ran the church since L. Ron's death? Is L. Ron alive somewhere as a fully operating thetan? How the fuck did they get their claws into Tom Cruise? First, let's kind of review what Scientologists believe. Okay, the ultimate goal of Scientology is to become an operating thetan. Yeah, at that point, you would no longer require physical form. You're self-aware, immortal soul with total control over matter, energy, space, time. You're all powerful. You're a fucking god, basically. Uh, the journey to get there is known as the bridge to total freedom. However, uh, how to get that far is really never fully explained. Instead, once you get to the highest level of Scientology, currently operating level uh, 8, OT8, operating Thetan 8, um, but basically, uh, and, and this was added, I guess, uh, two years after his death, but supposedly Elrond wrote it. And it's just kind of some revelations-type nonsense about some antichrist and really doesn't explain how you're supposed to become immortal. You know, the hardest part of the story, though, to write is the end. And I don't, <laughs> and I don't think Scientologists have figured out what that end is yet. Uh, you know, because it's a it's fucking, it's, it's 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 a nonsensical story. It's hard to wrap up. the The author's dead, and because it's a pay as you go level system, there's no incentive to have a definitive end. Because you know, like uh, Elrond, he just before he died, he just kept creating like more levels of knowledge you're supposed to attain, and it, and it gets more expensive as as you go higher. You know, and and you would never want to stop that. Like, why would you want to fucking kill your profit? You know, you don't want to have an end, and then people are like, all right, I got it now. I guess uh, fucking I don't need to show up anymore to the audience sessions. No, man, you gotta you gotta keep fucking pushing it. You gotta keep pushing it forward. You gotta sell some more shit. Um, I don't know. They probably will write some more eventually. They'll probably magically uncover some more secrets Elron hid, written by somebody else to kind of keep levels going. I don't, or maybe it's supposed to be confusing. You know, you can't you can't make it easy to become a fully operating thetan. It's only it's only for a select few for some reason. I never understand why it's only for a select few. I guess maybe because it's like it's no fun to win a, win a video game that everyone else can also easily win. There's no deep satisfaction in that. Uh, L. Ron <laughs> said before he died that not even Jesus or Buddha made it all the way. Based on a recorded speech from David Miscavige announcing L. Ron's passing, now, the Scientologists do seem to believe that L. Ron made it. David talked of uh, L. Ron, the Ronald, uh, no longer requiring his physical form. He's, he's going on to do more research, make more Scientology discoveries uh, as a fully operating Thetan. He just, you know, his body was a hindrance. He's got to fucking, he's got to go on and just float around, I guess, and work on some shit out in space. Uh, Scientologists also, based on that intro video and other information I discussed, believe that Scientology, unlike other religions, gives you the tools you need to kick some ass in this lifetime. You know, it's not just about the fucking being a thetan. 
uh, operate at a clear level, be a borderline superhero now by getting rid of all your engrams, right? All your negative engrams. Fucking get it out of you, man. Get get the Xeno uh, engrams out. Get the get the normal engrams out. You know, I don't know. Let's uh, <laughs> let's let's look at some more interesting Scientology shit uh, a little co- closer. Uh, kind of like the best of what I found, just random stuff with some weird facts. Weird facts. All right, this first one's my favorite part of the whole episode. This is this is OT three. So remember uh, when <laughs> when uh, Elron writes his second book, goes from Dianetics to Scientology. You know, way back when in in the in the in the fifties. You know, Dianetics fails. It's just accounting thing. He's like, I got to up the ante. Got to add some more sci-fi. Got to make it more of religion. And he talks about there was that weird thing 75,000 years ago that happened, this traumatic experience that affects us today. There was Xenu, that alien dictator. Well, uh, operating uh, OT3, operating level three is, is where he gets into all this. It's three levels above the clear. So see, like you become fully clear. You become a fully clear person, which means you've gotten rid of your normal engrams. And then to go beyond that, you got to like get into the sci-fi shit to, to, to go up the bridge to get to become a fucking space hero, <laughs> whatever the shit it is. And, uh, and you, and you, and you got to buy these, you know, levels. Uh, you got to spend some time. I, I watched an interview with Leah Remini talking about attaining this level. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, hilarious to hear, uh, kind of her talk about how disappointed she was after being in the church for years and years. Cause you, cause you have to pay, but it's not like you just like, you get to pay for one level and then you're immediately like, all right, like if you're rich, you just can't, you can't be like, all right, I'll just pay for the whole thing and just, just fucking knock it out. Now you got to do one. You got to let it soak in for a while. You got to do a bunch of auditing for a certain amount of time. It takes you years and years and years to, to get up to the wall of fire. You know, for example, walk through that just like, just like Hubbard did in the sixties. So, okay. So you pay your money. Uh, you get approved after years and years of waiting for this info. This is some deep Scientology shit. And then you're given a manila folder. It's taken out of a locked briefcase. I love the drama of the presentation. This shit has to be guarded because it would kill a mere mortal like myself if I read it, uh, you know, without going through the previous steps. That's how they present it to people. That's how Leah Remini said it was presented to her. Uh, and then you go to a, a private room to read it. And this is what it says. It's just like it's one piece of paper. You wait all this time. This is like the first big secret. Now he's gotten like new levels and you go all the way to eight. But this is like the first big secret. People waited fucking years for this. Went, went through a lot of abuse in Scientology. Ostracized from their families. They got to know how to become immortal. Finally, you go into a fucking room. You're given a manila foot. You get one piece of paper. And here's what it says. The head of the Galactic Confederation, 76 planets around larger stars, visible from here, founded 95 million years ago, solved overpopulation by mass implanting. The leader, a tyrant's named Xenu, set out to capture the trillions who opposed him and deposited them on volcanoes on the prison planet of Tajiak, otherwise known as Earth. I am, I am glad we went with Earth. That's way better than Tajiak. He then eradicated them and all life on the planet with hydrogen bombs, leaving only the Thetans, or souls of the captives, which were then brainwashed or implanted to rid them of their original identities. Man, brainwashing souls. This Xenu is a powerful motherfucker, I guess. That is some top-shelf sorcery shit right there. Man, brainwashing something that literally doesn't even have a brain. Millions of years later, when life began on Tajiak, the traumatized attached themselves on human bodies. And that's why we're fucked up, you guys. Our problems aren't just caused by the reactive mind, as it turns out. We have these body thetans literally attached to us. They're inside of us. And we are reliving the ancient trauma of Xenu's genocide. And if you want to reach your full potential, all right? You want to fucking be an operating thetan, motherfucker? Well, you got to clear these damaged thetans out of you. You got to heal their trauma and you got to set them free. If you want to hear someone who's received this information talk about it, watch Leah Remini's uh, interview with Joe Rogan on YouTube where she talks about reading this for the first time again. Uh, again, she waited years and then just got to this like, what? Seriously? Oh, man. You know, because it's just like some shitty pulp sci fiction, pulp uh, sci fi, some, some nonsense fiction, which is exactly what the whole all of Scientology is. It's just the drivel of a pulp fiction author. Uh, number two on Weird Facts Charles Manson supposedly studied Scientology in the early 1960s, used some of its techniques on his followers, right? Manson, man, using L. Ron's words of wisdom to get the family together. Number three, unlike uh, any other religion, Scientology specifically seeks out celebrities. 
The center was a synergistic vehicle for Project Celebrity. An internal church, church newsletter, Elron wrote in 1969, advised the flock to hunt for A-list quarries such as Greta Garbo, Walt Disney, Orson Welles. Well, celebrities are very special people, he wrote in 1973. They have communication lines that others do not have. Well, they didn't get those early ones, but they eventually got Tom Cruise, right? They eventually got John Travolta, Leah Remini, Juliette Lewis, Jenna Elfman, Kirstie Alley, Elizabeth Moss, Danny Masterson, Laurie Perpon. Number four. According to longtime member and recent defector Leah Remini, who grew up in the church when she was 10, uh, her mother moved to the family from Brooklyn to Scientology, to the Scientology Center in Clearwater, Florida, which is like the mecca now for Scientology. Scientology absolutely brainwashes members. Uh, quote, very early on in the brainwashing process, Elrond's technology teaches you that outside sources, the news, the internet, books, magazines, are all lies and hell-bent on destroying something decent like Scientology. The AMA, the APA, all governments do not give Scientology its due because they have a vested interest in not healing people and not helping people. End quote. It's all fake news. It's all fake news, everybody. Don't trust the journalists. Trust only the Ronald. Number five, new members of Sea Org, Scientology's inner circle, sign a billion-year contract when they get started. Seriously. Seriously. It says it on the paper. They sign up for a fucking billion years. Because when their physical form dies, their thetan is still obligated to serve Scientology, you know, as it finds new physical hosts. Uh-huh. Number six, Scientology had its own children's pop group for 20 years, and it's fucking great in the worst way. Uh, started in the early 90s, called Kids on Stage for a Better World. That's a shit, that's a shit title. I'm going to say that right now. It's way too long. New Kids on the Block was long, but it had some fucking cachet. Sound, it, sound, it had some coolness to it. Kids on stage for a better world. It sounds as horrible as it, as it is. It's ter- they're ter- as t- they were as terrible at music as Scientology is at religion. Uh, go to better, betterworldkids.com if you need a good laugh. They sing a version of Kim Wilde's um, We're the Kids in America, but they change it to We're the Kids of the Future. Whoa, we're the Kids of the Future. Whoa. No, you're not because your group's over. Uh, the delusion it takes to believe in Scientology seems to carry over to the delusion one can sing and do a choreographed dance when one can't. Uh, number seven, this is, uh, this is insane. John Travolta is authorized to kill as he sees fit within Scientology. According to Leah Remini, who claimed this while being interviewed by Joe Rogan, John Travolta was given the title of Concon, or I'm sorry, Kakan. He was given the title of Kakan, it's an equally stupid word, by L. Ron Hubbard years ago, uh, which gave him the power to not be punished by Scientology for murder. She, <laughs> she said there are a few policies called ethics protection and responsibility of leaders that state that you got to do whatever you got to do to protect the leader or you're in violation of Scientology ethics. Like if you see a body, fucking no questions if, if Travolta killed him, right? He's, he's, he has that power. You just clean it up and you just go about your day. No wonder he was ready to play a hitman for that Pulp Fiction comeback role years ago. He probably just like killed a, a few lesser Scientologists through some method preparation. Get ready for that shit. Uh, if that's true, and I don't know why she'd lie about that. Everything else she said in the interview that I saw uh, checked out with everything I, I found in a ton of research. I, I kind of get why celebrities stay in Scientology, man. Tom Cruise, he's probably skull-fucking someone's, some Scientologist's father in front of him to test his obedience as you listen to this right now. <laughs> All right. All right, I'd say let's hop out of weird facts, but really this entire episode is just a weird facts segment. Weird facts. Okay, so back to the history of the church for just a bit. Since Elrond's death, David Miscavige, uh, Miscavige has been the church's leader. This cult, religion, whatever you want to call it, uh, so young, it's only, had, it's only on a second leader. And like Leah Remini, uh, David was basically born in. 1968, when he was eight years old, his dad took him to a Scientologist auditor instead of a doctor to look uh, into his asthma attacks. For whatever reason, the attacks stopped after the auditing session, and the family went all in on Elrond, full Hubbard. Uh, they moved uh, one of the church's early compounds called uh, St. Hill. That's where they moved in England. By the age of 12, David was auditing others, a precocious kid by 13. He was given security checks to senior Scientology execs. By 14, he was personally giving Elrond uh, special seat and hand jobs as they're known within the organization. Sorry, that last part is not true. And I, and I do need to actually say that's not, <laughs> it's not true because this shit's so crazy. I feel like if I didn't point that out, you'd be like, no, nah, that sounds right. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds legit. Uh, what's funny to me is even though the family joined Scientology because uh, it supposedly cured David's asthma, early members who knew young David and left the church said he was uh, still severely asthmatic. <laughs> Dude just fucking loves to rewrite history. Uh, chip off the old L. Ron. Well, David dropped out of high school, signed his billion-year contract for Sea Org at 16, versus fucking fake Navy. Uh, within a year, he was one of Elrond's uh, personal messengers, the Commodore's messenger, because Elrond gave him the title of Commodore. Of course he did. Fuck, he was a douchebag. One of the young, 
uh, what he was one of the messengers were like the young Scientologists who would surround L. Ron and, and pass his messages along to other members of church leadership. Uh, I get, you know, the dude just loved to watch a face beaming with the ignorance of youth, just gaze upon him like young girls, like young fucking assistants. People didn't question him. David was also part of a special team assigned to protecting L. Ron from any legal trouble when Operation Snow White backfired and the FBI went after the church. Damn suppressive organization trying to get poor old L. Ron. Poor, poor L. Ronald. Leave that poor old Ronald alone. He, he ain't done nothing to nobody know how. Uh, he's also the one who told L. Ron's wife, Mary Sue, that because she did get convicted by the FBI, she's going to have to leave the church. Ah, sorry about that. You're going to have to ne- just stay away from all of us and never come here again. Heartless. He really did that. Uh, chip off the old Ronald. Uh, he also became this aggressive lapdog of sorts for L. Ron. Uh, sicked on anyone critical of the Ronald. Uh, he took auditing... Uh, of those suspected uh, of hiding something to new abusive levels, screaming obscenities upon them. And according to numerous firsthand accounts and various documentaries I watched, just beating the fuck out of people whenever he feels like it. And this new, more aggressive tone, uh, yeah, apparently it's just, you know, it just stayed. You know, David is the new dictator within the church. He doesn't write scripture like Elrond did from what I can find, uh, but he does command, you know, what's, what needs to be done, and you, and you don't question it. Check out this statement by a former Scientologist regarding abuse. This is, quote, Hall joined the church marketing unit in 1987, which brought him into more frequent contact with Miscavige, who holds the title chairman of the board, or COB. Hall said it was a shock the first time he saw Miscavige attack an executive, Ray Mithoff. The second time was like something out of a cartoon. Hall says Miscavige came up behind two seated executives, Mark Yeager and Guillaume Lezever, grabbed their heads and banged them together. Then he ground them against each other. Lezever had blood coming out of his ear. Get the fuck... Can you imagine a report leaking of a bishop doing that to a priest, of some pastor doing that to a deacon? Jesus! That's fucking insane. Why all the violence? Well, because they think they're at war. They think they're at war with suppressive. They think they're saving the human race. They're delusional, dangerous, and insane. Do you ever watch that old Scientology promotional video with Tom Cruise in it? Uh, The one with him wearing the black long sleeve turtleneck? If you haven't, and again, want some laughs, check it out on YouTube. Just put Tom Cruise Scientology. It's the first one that comes up. <laughs> check out the stuff he says. This is what these people, oh my God, they're so out there. He says stuff like, quote, being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. You drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one who can really help. But that's what drives me. I know we have an opportunity to really help. What are you talking about? You're the only one who can help you, narcissistic, Napoleon syndrome, delusional fuck. I think you have Scientologists confused with EMT or emergency room doctor in that situation. When have you you read an article about Tom Cruise stopping to help somebody uh, at an accident? Tom Cruise has lived in L.A. for years. He lived in L.A. for years, for decades. You drive by a car accident literally every day in Los Angeles. There should be thousands of articles by now about Tom Cruise helping people who just got into a car accident, you know? It's a news reporter after news reporter. Actor Tom Cruise saved another family today on the side of the 405 northbound. He used an e-reader to audit the father's arm back on after it was severed in the crash. All hail Tom Cruise. All hail L. Ron Hubbard. All hail Scientology. That fucking, <laughs> that reporter got a little weird at the end there. Went a little kooky. In that same <laughs> video, Tom always says, in my opinion... You're either on board or you're not on board. But if you're on board, you're on board just like the rest of us. This is an OT7, operating Thetan level 7, and he clearly doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. That was just some insane gibberish he just spouted. And by the way, that was a self-contained cut from the video. It was, I didn't take it out of context. There is no context for that other than just sheer lunacy. He also says, quote, We are the authorities on getting people off drugs. We are the authorities on the mind. We are the authorities on improving the human condition. We can rehabilitate criminals. Really? Then do it, dickhead. Tell the U.S. government you'd like to start taking all their criminals into your centers the moment they're released and see how far you can lower recidivism rates. Just stop crime, Scientology. Do it with your dime store Pulp Fiction scripture, you fucking jackasses. First time I saw this video, I wondered why someone as successful as Tom Cruise would risk his public reputation with just this craziness. But then listening to the Leah Remini interview with Joe Rogan, which I I really do recommend, made a lot of sense. Uh, She explained that despite how famous of an actor Tom is, and I never would have thought of this, The adoration of the public as a celebrity pales in comparison to the respect and adoration he's getting within Scientology. Like he's one of the top five ranked Scientologists in the world. He's in the inner circle of this church hierarchy, and he's their number one celebrity. He's more famous than Travolta. 
He, he's one of the most recognizable faces in the world. Remember, Elrond specifically sought out celebrities and catered to them. There was an entire Scientology celebrity center on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood. And she says that no one is allowed to question Tom. No one's allowed to, to, to give an opinion uh, without being asked. No one's allowed to criticize him in any way ever. He's given a staff of assistants who surround him on his uh, movie sets and everything. They're literally not allowed to say no. If Tom wants a specific coffee when he's way out in the middle of nowhere on some location shooting a movie, you don't just say, like, I don't know where I can find that. You fucking get it done. You figure it the fuck out. Or you're going to be punished by the church, you suppressive piece of shit. Tom wants you to sing some Michael McDonald, Helm Doobie Brothers, a little minute by minute, right? Even though you know that your podcast audience doesn't want to hear it, you fucking do it. Minute by minute by minute by minute. I keep holding on. I keep holding on. Ha <laughs> ha! It's been a second since I threw a McDonald earwig into your brain. Have fun with that for the next few days because it's going nowhere. It's just going to pop up. You know it's just going to pop minute by minute by minute. But I keep holding on. Scientology is the only organization uh, able to stroke Tom's enormous megastar Evo. E uh, Evo. <laughs> Ego. <laughs> Even more than Hollywood. I was coming off of that Michael McDonald high. I have to get used to regular words again. Instead of, yeah, I'm gonna be there. Okay, now other sources, such as HBO's Going Clear, say that stars stay in the church because they're afraid to have secrets they've revealed during auditing sessions shared with the world. Now, according to former auditors, every auditing session is recorded. And so, like, they're like, well, maybe Cruz, you know, doesn't want his secrets getting out. I don't know. I think maybe he just, you know, loves being essentially feared and worshipped like a god on earth. All right. One last thought on Scientology. As you've noticed, I've been super hostile <laughs> towards Scientology. Uh, here's the main reason. I think the worst aspect of this cult, and I do think it's a cult, absolutely, is the process of disconnection. As been talked about by former members at length on various documentaries uh, and interviews, I actually worked on Leah Remini's uh, first reality show in another life uh, as a consultant uh, producer, a show about her family uh, called It's All Relative on TLC. And I, and I interviewed some of her family members uh, during pre-production, got them on the phone to talk about, you know, like some possible storylines, things we could work with for the show. And, and, they, and they revealed they recently just left Scientology. And they talked about how people they had been friends with for decades, other Scientologists now avoided eye contact with them at the grocery store, wouldn't return their calls or texts, complete and total rejection of contact. Why? That's church doctrine. Anyone who leaves the church is labeled a suppressive person, not to be communicated with ever again by another church member. Which would be one thing if, you know, other members were just casual acquaintances. But however, that same doctrine applies to family members. Your daughter drops out of the church, you're forbidden to talk to her ever again. Or you yourself can be kicked out. And this can be a church you're financially dependent on. No seeing your grandkids. No walking her down the aisle at her wedding. Nothing. She's fucking dead to you. All because she doesn't buy what the church is selling. A religion doesn't do that. A fucking cult does that. A shitty, dangerous, insecure cult. Fuck Scientology. Fuck L. Ron Hubbard. Fuck David Miscavige. And fuck Tom Cruise, who, based on every Scientology video I've ever watched of him, seems to have a bigger ego than most nations. However, I feel no anger to the lower members, man. I feel pity. You're a victim. You've been suckered in under the guise of self-help. You're probably at a low spot in your life when you first went there. You were desperate and confused, and now you're being taken advantage of by an abusive for-profit cult posing as a religion that wants to own your every thought, a group that will rip you apart from your family if you are not completely obedient to their insane pulp fiction doctrine written by a failed writer, a proven liar, a lecherous old control freak, a dude who charges members thousands and thousands, in some cases millions, for people to finally learn that the reason you feel bad is because some ancient alien dictator Xenu blew up some ancient Thetans with some hydrogen bombs and then brainwashed their souls into forgetting they were all powerful beings. Are you fucking serious? My Church of Nimrod quickly made up bullshit, where Nimrod is the creator of the universe, he's the giant space Sasquatch the size of a galaxy with the head of a chupacabra who rides a black unicorn, with suns for eyes. That makes more sense than the soul brainwashing of Xenu, right? Oh, oh my God, you know? And that's Scientology, you know? If you're in it, uh, get out. And if you're not in it, stay out. And, uh, but if you are in it and you're listening to Time Suck and you have been, uh, please keep listening. Uh, you know, just, just, you know, calm down about this episode. I, I can't afford to lose my Scientology uh, coalition. Members. Coalition. Why did I say coalition? That makes no sense. But I can't afford to lose, you know, my Scientology demographic numbers. That, that word doesn't make sense either. I'm trying to think of a fucking word. My Scientology contingent. I can't lose my Scientology contingent. I already lost all my Syrian Islamic fundamentalist members. I lost my lizard Illuminati and flat earth, flat earth believer members a long time ago. And I don't want to lose you. 
but I do want to take you into some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, L. Ron Hubbard, a known science fiction author, invented a science fiction-based religion in the 1950s and turned it into an international empire that, according to a 2015 Fortune.com article, is worth about $1.75 billion, with roughly $1.5 billion of that in real estate. Wow. Number two, based on what I could find online to go from taking your first audit to reaching OT8, it's going to cost you, if you made no mistakes, never have to uh, undergo extra auditing, which sounds impossible from everything I've read and heard, a minimum of $380,000 based on what are presented as inside price listings. Now, I'm not a big fan of major religions, uh, but at least Jesus and Muhammad are free. Number three, Tom Cruise has more emergency medical knowledge than medically trained EMTs. He's a Scientologist. And being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. You drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one who can really help. So if you are ever in a serious accident, don't pray for God to save you. Don't hope that ambulance, don't call some lawyer. You pray for Tom Cruise. Number four, do not fuck with John Travolta because apparently he has a license to kill. He's the Kakan. He is the Kakan. All hail Kakan Travolta. Five, do not fuck with Scientology, says the guy fucking with Scientology. They took on the IRS and won. They may be batshit crazy, but they are a laser-focused batshit kind of crazy. And I hope they never set that laser beam on me. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Man, that was fun. That was my favorite uh, Time Suck podcast yet. Could have kept researching that one for weeks. And man, what truly a time suck. I never wanted to stop reading and watching those videos. Incredibly interesting. And again, if you want to learn more, uh, read uh, Janet Reitman's amazing book. That's R-E-I-T-M-A-N, uh, Inside Scientology. She's not sponsoring the show, by the way. No one sponsored this episode. That was a completely voluntary endorsement. And watch uh, my Scientology movie. It's in some little art house cinemas now. Very well put together. Stylistically different uh, than a lot of documentaries I've seen in a good way. Uh, for tour dates, Tempe. Next weekend, The Improv, uh, and then Cleveland and San Fran coming up. Go to timesuckpodcast.com, uh, click on Stand Up Tour and more to get all the dates that are currently listed. And while you're there, you can donate to the show if you feel so inclined. You can click that uh, little PayPal button, do that. You can click the Amazon button if you want to help the show while you shop. And you can click the, uh, the shop to get that first edition Time Suck t-shirt made out of 200% pure, unadulterated, Xenu-approved OT8 Full operating feet and baby bottoms. And most importantly, have a great weekend and keep on sucking. Oh, shit.